Okay, today we're going to be talking about XGen Interactive Grooming. So, um, the way to make fur for our Muppet, our fur characters here. And for this demonstration, I have on the D2L well under Demo Resources, um, Sphere Demo 1 right here, which is an OBJ, OBJ file. And so, you can just download that and work off of this. All this model is, is it's just a sphere a polysphere that I UV'd. And let's see here. The reason for having that is just so we don't have to kind of refresh over the UVing side of the demonstration here. And also just to give you a simple object to work with as you first kind of um, dip your feet into this concept of working with fur. So this demo is going to be comprised of two different steps and or two different lessons, I should say. In the first lesson, I'm going to be working with that OBJ, that, that simple sphere. Then in the second part of the lesson, I'll show um, my character model and some steps that you might want to do with your character model to kind of get started with the fur on the, the real thing. So to open that OBJ, um, I had downloaded it previously, so I already, I already put it into my project folder. So I can just go to File, Open, and in my project folder, which is starting to get pretty busy now, I included, I put it in my scenes folder right here. Oh, and I pressed open, which is the wrong command. You see how it's grayed out right there. So I'm going to cancel that and go to file and then import rather than open. And then open the sphere demo there. And now we got it. And so if I check this in the UV mode, you can see right there that it's UV'd and we get a checkerboard on the on the sphere here so we have something that we can work with and so let's move on to the XGen Interactive Groom so the XGen Interactive Groom you, you need to click on the workspace tab up top and you can see XGen right there and this is not what we want so XGen right here um, is really helpful but for other things so it's it's better um it's better used for making things like grass and kind of a wider array of uh, uses xgen interactive groom is more artist friendly and it's more specific towards what we're aiming for with this project with fur for a character here so i'll do xgen interactive groom and i just would like to further emphasize that if if I clicked on XGen rather than an XGen Interactive Groom, it's a totally different system that's being kind of opened up here to the right. So we, if you open up the wrong workspace, you, you won't really be able to get this thing going here. So um, when you open up XGen Interactive Groom, we get these. You should get these three tabs right here. So we have XGen Interactive Groom Editor, which is going to be the main window that we have here. We also have the channel box layer editor. And if you don't see that, you can just go to Windows, General Editors, second one down, channel box layer editor right there to open that one up. And so this will be helpful because I'm gonna wanna use some display layers down here. I just, I pretty much always do that. So, you know, you, you might not prefer that, but that's kind of what I tend to do here. And then finally, the outliner, just so that I can see what's in my scene here. So right now I just have the sphere demo right there or the Sphere Demo OBJ. And again, if you don't see the Outliner, it's just Windows, down to Outliner right there. So this is the tab that we want right now, which is the XGen Interactive Groom Editor. And we have our Sphere selected in the, um, the Object Mode right there, if I right click and go to Objects Mode. And the first step to create fur is we just go to this little tab that says Create, and then Interactive Groom Spline, so the first one down. So Create Interactive Groom Splines and click on that. It'll give you this box, and you can rename it if you want the description to have a, a different name. I'll just call this Fur um, Groom. And so we have some sliders here, and you can set the sliders here, but we can also adjust all these later. So it's just the defaults are probably going to be fine here, and if if it's not, we can we can adjust it in some of the settings here coming up. But I think this carried over from last time. So, and last time this worked out pretty okay. 
So you might want to just double check and make sure that the settings look something like this so that you can follow along here. And so once you have the settings the way you want, you can just press apply and I'll close out this window. And you can see that the fur generated around my object right there in its kind of default form. And under this window right here, we have an instance for, you remember how I renamed it, fur underscore groom. So that's kind of our fur instance that we created. And this, um, this hair, this fur, is generated out of the UVs of the model. So this only works if your model is UV'd. So if you need a refresher on how to UV, just look back at one of my previous lessons. I have a few lessons on that on the, the playlist here. And let's see here, oops. So if we check back on the outliner here, you'll see here that before we only had our OBJ, but now we have that, that fur instance right there showing up in our um, outliner. So it's in the scene. And this kind of brings me, just as we're doing initial setup here, why I like to have the channel box layer editor here is you can see with this fur, it gives us a preview of what the fur looks like, but this isn't the most descriptive render that we're getting here right now. And so what I like to do, especially when just first messing around with this, is just set up a really basic light lighting scheme and put on a display layer so that you can kind of render things when you're ready to see them and they're kind of more accurately here. So what I like to do here is I'll just go to Arnold, Lights, and you can set up like a nice lighting system if you'd like, particularly if you have your character set up and you want to start thinking about that. But if you want to just sketch something in briefly, I, I can sometimes just do the skydome lighting, do the defaults. So it'll kind of, the skydome light, if you recall, is where you plug in your own um, map for the sky and then it projects your image onto the scene in every direction and helps create photorealistic renders. Um, by default, it's just kind of a gray white getting projected from every direction and it creates kind of an ambient occlusion looking render here and so i'll create a skydome light here but if this was my final project i would either delete this before moving on to my final renders and kind of start over and do like a real lighting scheme um, or build off of it and attach an hdri map to it and all that stuff so anyway lights skydome light i'll create that and i'll project from every direction I like to make sure that that skydome light is selected and then under the display layers, I'll just go to layers, create layer from selected, double click, and I'll just call this um, sky. And now I can just kind of turn off and on that visibility. If it's just kind of getting in my way, sometimes um, it can kind of get in the way while you're trying to click things. You can also click on this not once, but twice, and it'll turn it into a reference Kind of layer which means that it's still there it just you can't click on it by mistake so um that's kind of the options that you have available to you there i'll just i'll do that option where i turn it into a reference layer and so now if i go to arnold and render before i created that light if i rendered it would just be a black box but now if i do arnold render you can see that i have my scene kind of lit from all directions in a very basic kind of way so again when you render your characters please uh, move you know let's do a more advanced lighting scheme which i'll show in future, future lessons don't just kind of settle for this but it is good for just kind of getting started here especially when you're trying to learn how this fur behaves so anyhow that's my setup and so let's move back to interactive groom here so we have this window right here and this is the instance we created. Remember when I went to selected the model, went to create interactive groom splines right there. It created this instance. And we have under it, you should have these two tabs. So we have the tool settings, which we don't need now, but we'll go over soon. And we have the attribute editor, which is what you do want right now. And so you see nothing shows up there right now. And so I just need to make sure that this is selected, my, my instance right there. And now all these tabs show up for it. And so the way I like to think of XGen Interactive Groom is I like to think of it as you kind of have like three um, chapters, I will call it, of control. So the first chapter is these settings that are under the attribute editor when you have this instance selected right here. 
and these are all global controls of the hair. So if you want to change, for instance, I'm going all the way to the right tab where it says hair physical shader one, and I can change the root color and the tip color of the hair all throughout just by double clicking on that box and say I'll change it to a light purple here. So that's the root color and then for the tip color I'm going to change it to something a little more of a white light pink here and then press done and you can see that the model updates all around right there. So you can change the color of it here. One thing that I will show perhaps in this lesson here is the you can see these checkerboard boxes next to the root color and the tip color is you can um, take a color map that you paint either in Photoshop or using Mudbox and attach it here and that way you can paint right onto your model. For instance, if you have a character who has uh, polka dots on them, for instance, you can paint the polka dots on the color map, attach it right here, and then this fur will show up with polka dots on it. So I will try to show that coming up in the lesson here. So kind of going through the rest of the controls, it's not just the color we can change, it's just basically anything you can think of in terms of a global control that's kind of on the more basic side of things, you're going to find it in one of these tabs. So for instance, if I want to take, let's just kind of click through these right here. So we have the density right here, so we have the density multiplier. And so right now you can see that the fur is not that dense right now. And if I want the fur to be more frequent here, I can just either pull the slider or I'll just type two and I'll double the, the density right there. And if I want to triple the density from where it was, I'll type three, enter, and you can see it's starting to fill in. Uh, be careful pulling the slider. There's been a couple of times where I've pulled the slider kind of by mistake and then it goes up here and then the computer can't handle all the fur that was generated and it crashes. So I tend to kind of click in here and type the number and make sure I have it right before I press return. I'm going to bring it back to one for now just so my computer can keep up. Since I'm doing a, a zoom capture right now it, it kind of um, takes a lot out of my computer. And sometimes what I like to do here is if my computer is struggling at all is I'll work with a low density. And then at the very end, when I'm starting to kind of feel good that I have everything set the way I want, at that point, I'll kind of add that density in at the end so that I'm not sitting there struggling, fighting against the, the computer um, the whole time while I'm working. So you can see here, we're, let's just work from right to left here. So we started with the hair physical shader where we can change the color. You can also change a lot of the specularity, transparency, transmission of the hair right here, the way that it behaves under these settings right here. Um, right here we have the fur groom base and so the main control that I mess with here is that density multiplier right there. If we go to scale this is where you're going to set the length of the hair. So right now it's set to one and if I take that slider and I pull it up you can see the hair gets much longer and if I pull it down, the hair gets much shorter. And it's all uniform all the way throughout. There's no variation to it. So let's just kind of keep that. I'm going to keep that back at one here just for this demonstration. You can see the mask there too do its work. So um, that's the scale tab right there. Going to Sculpt. We can kind of move past the sculpt here as we're going over the basic controls here. So let's keep moving to the fur groom shape. And so the fur groom shape is where you can set, you can see here that the hair is very square, like it's a rectangular. You see the width at the beginning is the width at the end right there. And so if you want to add taper, there's two places you can do it. You can simply just grab this taper slider right here and then drag it up and you can see it turns into spikes right here and you can change where the taper starts. So as I drag that up, the taper starts later and later in the hair. We kind of zoom in here. Let's look at, um, see here, this hair right here is a good one to look at. So as I drive the, drag the taper start up towards the top, you can see the taper has very shallow. And if I drag it down, it's very gradual right there. And if I set the taper to one, it's at max. 
Um, negative one is at its minimum, and then zero is at kind of a neutral position here. And what I'll typically use, I, I don't really use this area that much, and I usually rather prefer deal with the width ramp. And so here you can just draw in the taper. So on the left side is the base of the hair, and then on the right side is the, the end of the hair. And you can either draw it in here, or you can click this arrow and expand out so you can see it in a larger view. And I'm gonna shrink this down a little bit so we can you can kind of keep your eye on this hair as I manipulate this. So I can just see click right here in the top corner and draw on a ramp. And I like to kind of keep a little bit of space there so it's not at a zero value at the end of the hair. And so you can see here, this is kind of the profile of the hair. You see that the bevel starts kind of there and if I drag it to the left, it's more gradual. If I drag it to the right, it's more abrupt. And I can also click in multiple points here and get a lot of levels of control on this. So if I want it to gradually ramp down, there's no limit to the number of anchors that you can add into this line right here. And if you want to delete one of these anchor points, you can just click on that X right there at the bottom and add it back. So you can delete them by clicking on these X's down here, or you can add them just by clicking right on the line and drawing it back in. A really simple, straightforward system right there. So I'll close that out. And let's see here. Moving on to the next tab, we have Fur Groom, which we don't really need to worry about right now. Let's see. There's one that I'm missing. There we go. Um, so above the taper, this uh, we have taper, taper start, but above that is width scale, and I do use this a lot, which is just the the width of the hair. So you can see you can have get the hair to be the hair to be really thick, almost like uh, feathers, right here. If I drag it up, and then if I drag it down, I can get just very very thin in there if I want it to be. So a lot of control in there. The character, what I'm kind of going for with my character in the future is I want him to have like a little bit of a yarn look. So I might go with a little bit thicker hair than um, others might, you know? So just kind of keep that in mind that that's what I'm going for here. You might want that hair a little bit thinner or a little bit thicker, depending on what you're going for. So that is when you have this group, the fur groom instance selected and you get these the, the attribute editor and you have these tabs here. So just kind of go through the tabs, familiarize yourself, and you can have a lot of the basic controls here. And that's kind of chapter one, as I like to call it, for the controls for the interactive groom editor. So chapter two here is we're still working globally, but we're gonna add new instances to get new controls on this thing. And so if I press this plus button right next to fur groom editor, you can see here that we have these instances within it that we can control. And don't worry about sculpt yet. That's gonna be kind of chapter three when we get into that. But we have the scale, for instance, which is what we've kind of already adjusted here. And the fur groom base, which is, those, are, those two things right there are all things that we've been controlling so far under the attribute editor here. And so the chapter two is where we add modifiers and so you have this big button right here and you can just click on it and it expands out this menu. And these are global modifiers that change all over the fur, but it's kind of new kinds of controls. So you're adding more kinds of controls on top of what we already have down there. So my favorite of these is the noise control. So add modifier and then go to noise control and you can see that instance shows up right there. You can even change the order of these if you want to. Oops, you can delete them as well if you right click. But I can um, drag it and change the order of these. And sometimes that can make a difference here as you mess with these. Um, but you can see the noise adds a little bit of a random curliness to it right off the bat. And so if you look at the attribute editor down here, when I click fur groom, all those tabs change. And then if I click on the noise, it changes there. And so we kind of get a new kind of set of global controls on the hair. So if I change the frequency up, 
it kind of straightens out a little bit. And then if I take the frequency, or say, if I take the frequency down, I'm sorry, um, it gets a little less curly in there, just generally speaking. And then if I take the frequency up, it gets very curly in there. And you can take the mask down. So the mask is kind of a way of, it's like an opacity slider, slider in Photoshop, right? If you like paint a layer in Photoshop and you have the opacity up all the way to 100, then what you drew is going to show up all the way. If you have it at zero, it's going to disappear, right? So that's what that is. Magnitude. <laughs> I want to just get that a little more under control right there. And the best way to kind of get used to these, I feel like, is just to kind of get in there and see for yourself, mess around with these a little bit. But we have a few controls in here we can mess with. And just because we've stepped on to the, um, the noise tab right here, um, sorry, I kind of started messing around with some of these other tabs. Just because we're, we added this noise tab, we can still always go back to the fur groom here and kind of go back and change things like the, the width of the hair, thin it out or make it a little bit thicker, you know, all that stuff. All those global controls are still there all the way through this entire process. And let's see here, so preserve length. If we look at this, the profile of this fur, you see right now that the preserve length is at zero. And if I drag it all the way up, it's got a little bit of a more nice randomness to it. So preserve length at zero means even though there's curls, like the edge of these are still making like pretty much a perfect sphere all the way around the hair, which is not very realistic. So I like to sometimes drag this up, often kind of all the way. Um, and just get a little bit more randomness in there. You can see as I drag the correlation, it's kind of a crazy look there. You can also animate these, by the way. Um, and same as before, where we had the, the graph here that we can manipulate. You can set it so that the hair is mostly straight through the base, and then those curls start to come up at the end, or you could have it go the opposite way. Or if I draw it like, oops, if I draw it, I'm gonna delete that, delete that. And I draw it in this way. It should straighten out. You see how it's curly? at the base down here and then it straightens out at the very end is because I drew it right here. So it's, this is the magnitude scale right here. Um, I think I'm going to keep it up and keep this relatively subtle, but maybe like a little bit curlier at the top and a little straighter as we get towards the base here. And so that's kind of the noise control right there. And you have all these other modifiers here that you can mess around with. And so I just encourage you during this step here to, to mess around with these, like clump, for instance. Um, let's go ahead and kind of mess around with it here. So clump, so I want to add modifier, I want to clump right there. And you can see here, this is, you can kind of get a look using the clump to, um, if your character is wearing hair gel or something like that, for instance, the clump tool can be a really fun one to play around with here. Or if you're going to go for like a Dragon Ball Z look or something like this, that might be something to go for here or um, Final Fantasy VII kind of thing. So um, you, see, you, and you can see how it modified everything globally, but it, it's a new kind of control that we didn't previously have unless we added the modifier. So I don't really want the clump here. I just wanted to show it. So I can just right click and delete it right there. And so at any point, you can just right click on any of these modifiers and delete them. If you try it out and, you know, it's not for you, you know, you can just right click delete right here. Um, so that's kind of chapter two of the overview of the controls that you have with the XGen Interactive Fur. So chapter three here, as I call it, is where you kind of start to get into the brush controls of things. And so this is where you can really fine tune this and make it your own. And so the way to do this is it kind of happens under the sculpt layers and I might just drag this to the top just for fun. And 
if you notice on the sculpt layer, you can select it and you can drag the, you can, this is what I was saying before with Photoshop, where if you have it at 100, what you sculpt here is going to show up all the way. If you drag it to zero, it's like if you took the opacity on a drawing layer in Photoshop and dragged it to zero, where you're not going to be able to see it anymore. So you can kind of groom the hair on the sculpt layer right here. And if you like it the way it is, you can keep it at 100. And then if you're, you're like, I like it, but I want it to be a little more subtle, you can drag the slider down and it'll kind of bring it more back to its base level before you had started doing anything. So I'll work with that sculpt layer selected here. And to kind of start doing this chapter three of control here, I like to go to, or you go to um, generate at the top here. So top, top bar, you go to generate, then down to interactive groom tools. And then I suggest you just press this double dotted line right here and break off the menu so that you have access to these because you'll want to kind of keep them open and just go back to them and there's a nice little variety of brushes that you can use here. And so again, just kind of mess around with them and familiarize yourself with the controls or the brushes that you have available to you here. Um, my favorite brushes in my experience is I like the, the comb brush where you can kind of comb the hair and kind of brush it in. So that's the comb brush right there. There's also the length brush so you can kind of um, draw in um, some variation of length in your brushes here. You can also do that by drawing in a color map, by the way, under the scale. Sorry, if you go fur groom and then under the scale right here, if, if, you, if you attach a color map right here that's black and white under scale, you can kind of paint in your own length right there using a color map. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about. So that's the um, length brush. You can kind of brush that in. And then I like the part brush too. If you want to create a part in the hair, like if you have a character with um, a part in their hair, that can be really helpful here. And so this might be an instance before I start showing these, I might need to add the density, increase the density of my hair here a little bit. So I'm going to go to fur groom, down to fur groom base, find the density multiplier right there. And I'll just type in three, get this thing a bit more dense here. And let's just go ahead and I'm going to save this. So if it crashes, I won't lose my work. Um, and if I go to Arnold and render, you can see that my fur currently looks like this, which is kind of what I had in my head here, to be honest with the character in terms of just the global char characteristics of the hair. I just need to kind of add some more life into it with the brushes. So I'm going to press stop on the render so it's not eating up my um, processing power here. And I clicked on the sculpt layer so that this will be happening on the sculpt layer. And let's go over, I'll go over the length brush first. So I just click it, you can see length brush activated right there. And you, don't, you see how there's no, um, like a controller didn't show up, right? And so to get a controller to show up, we've been working under the attribute editor this whole time. So now just go under tool settings. And as long as length brush is what I have selected here, these are the controls for it. And the main shortcut that I use here is B. And then um, if you hold down B and then click, you can change the brush size right here. And that's kind of the main one I use. Um, you'll notice that on my computer right now, and this might happen for some of you, that my cursor is here, but sometimes the, the black circle shows up below it. Kind of ignore the black circle and just trust where your cursor is. That, um, that's a little confusing and it's a glitch. Hopefully that'll get ironed out here. Oh yeah, you can see the, you see, you see the circle always shows up below my brush. I'm not sure why it does that, but it's, um, it's at least indicating to me what my brush size, but where my the arrow point cursor is, or the crosshair cursor is, is where it's gonna brush right now. So you have, um, we're using the length brush. The size is important here. And then the two other controls that I think are generally the most important are the minimum length and the maximum length for the brush. And remember that brush, sens the how, sensi how sensitive you are with your Wacom tablet or your whatever tablet you're using will also kind of factor into a lot of these brushes here. 
And so if I draw this in right there, it's a little abrupt, but you see how it drew in where my cursor is and not where that round circle is, but I have the parameter set a little bit lower, so it kind of created a little bit of a cut in the hair. Let's see what happens when I adjust these a little bit. Okay, you can see it cut cut a bit more drastically right there. I'll set the minimum length just really low and see what happens. I'll set the maximum length really low. Right there. Okay, so I set the maximum length at 0.7 and the minimum length at 0.1 and it gives us a little buzz cut in here. And so if I want to add back in, you see I added the max length back up and I can just brush a little bit. And it's like, think about it as it's adding and subtracting that much to the, the, the hair length. And remember that I started off with a hair length of uh, one. You can always press edit undo if you don't like something. So that's command Z right there. And remember, I can hold B and drag this down if I want a smaller brush. And so here we can, you can see it's very small finicky controls right there. But if you want, oops, very finicky controls right there. But you can see that you can kind of draw in different lengths right there. So that's kind of the brush I tend to use if I want to change the length on the model. I feel like I get a little bit more control over it. There's also the cut brush up here. So I'll click on the cut brush. And if you click on the cut brush, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, okay. So um, you can see, I <laughs> just use the cut brush, Command Z, see if I can work that again. So you can kind of cut out areas of the hair right there using the cut brush. Let's see if I can get something a little more subtle. Um, you can see right there, it's just it's very abrupt, you know, um, and I turned off filter back faces right there so that I can make that cut. And I just, you know, I don't use this brush very much to be totally transparent here. I'm sure it's got its uses, but it's a little more too severe than what I typically want here. But it's there for a reason, and I'm sure some people can use it really well. So, you know, don't don't give up on it just because, you know, it's, it's not my favorite. Um, we also have the comb brush here. So I'll just click on the comb brush, and I'm going to give it a little bit more size, you can press B, drag up, get that brush size up. And so this one is a really helpful one. So if I wanna take this hair, let's just look at this at a few more angles. I wanna comb it right here. And I suggest a lot of little strokes here. Command Z is our friend here to edit undo anything. That's not what you want. You can see my strength is pretty high right there. Let's see what happens when I take, you see when I take the brush strength down a little bit. So it was at about 70 before and now it's at 10. Let's see it at about 17. And with this, there's the brush fall off, which is a really helpful tool. And here we go. So I think it's, Let's see if I can illustrate this some. Oops. So you see here with the root to magnitude control, I changed the, the graph here. And now when I brush, it's something like that. This is gonna have to deal with how far along the hair that the brush kind of takes effect here. Let's invert it. You see here, it's very subtle. You can kind of feel it more than you can see it, but it's a little more. I mainly, when I have the graph like this, it's mainly doing like the tip of the hair. Whereas if I switch it to be more like this, it's going to be a little more of the whole thing kind of getting moved right there. So you can see right here, switch it to here. 
And honestly, I just kind of tend to leave it around there and just kind of use small strokes to get it to go where I want it to go. And let's see what this looks like with that, like that. So I'm going to press save, then Arnold render. And you can see that we have the hair getting combed right there. And so you can continue to mess with these controls right here. Like there's the freeze brush, which I believe works a bit like a mask. If you want to kind of, if you like a certain area, you want to make sure that it doesn't get messed with, you can mess with that one right there. Um, just stop that render and close it out. And there's also the part brush right here. So if you click on the part brush, I can kind of, let's say right here, I can feel a part forming here. If I just draw my line right here, you see how I'm kind of like parting the sea right there a little bit. It's, um, you can, like if this is the top of your character's head and this is where the, the part in their hair is right here you can kind of start to get that going a little bit and get that defined. And I'm just moving my brush up and down right now, so I'm not drawing left to right. I'm drawing up and down right now to get this part going this way. Um, so that's another control that I really like a lot with this tool. So um, that is, yeah, and just kind of continue to mess around with these brushes right here. Um, most of them are pretty useful here, but those are kind of the, the main ones right there. And so those are the three levels of control right here. Also take note, I've been working on my sculpt layer right here. So if I drag the sculpt layer down to zero, right, it's a Photoshop, it's like a Photoshop layer where the passage is at zero percent, all that combing and brushing and cutting is like it never happened if it's at zero. And at 50%, it's, you know, it says if it's at 50% opacity and then 100 is the way that I had it. So, and again, I'm gonna save here. And so, what I'd like to show now is I showed before if we clicked on the fur groom area up here and we have all these attribute editor tabs and on the very right there is hair physical shader and I changed it to the root to be purple the tip to be kind of a pink or I guess they're both pink and one's darker and one's lighter and the whole thing is that way but let's say that you have a character with polka dots or anything like that um, also I think you're, you're pretty much always just going to want to do this option I'm about the show where you use the color map because if you look at any creature they're not just like a uniform fur all the way across like they'll the hair around their eyes and their mouth will at least be a little bit darker you know there'll be some kind of variation that happens there so um I know I keep saving but I'm going to save again and to paint this in I'm going to switch this over to a bit of a Mudbox tutorial, but it's going to be a really basic one. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Mudbox, just to kind of get it running here in the background. And what we're going to do is we're going to send that sphere down below the hair over to Mudbox and paint on it. And then we'll use that color map and apply it right here and right here. And it will get applied to the rest of the fur. So um, in the outliner, just click on the outliner and we'll get that it's hard to see down there, but the sphere below is selected because in the outliner, I selected it right there. And I'm just going to click on Mudbox just to tell it that all the default settings are fine. And so Maya and Mudbox are made by the same company, so they talk really well together, or at least they should talk really well together. And um, so with the sphere selected, I'll just go to File, Send to Mudbox right there, and then I'll send it as a new scene. So File, Send to Mudbox, Send as a new scene. And if I send this to Mudbox, um, sometimes you'll get these errors right here. And so this error, when, whenever you see it, it's called a uh, high valence vertex. If you recall, I made this out of a sphere. And if you can see here in the preview of the sphere that a bunch of vertices come in on one point at the very top and the very bottom. And that's not great for sculpting in Mudbox, but we're not sculpting in Mudbox, so that doesn't matter. So I'll keep that mesh and when I open up Mudbox, you can see that my sphere opens up and you can navigate around Mudbox the exact same way you do as in Maya where you hold down option and you do a normal click and you rotate around. You do a middle click and you pan left and right. And then if you do a right click, you can drag right and zoom in, drag left, zoom out. Um, and you 
I'm using a Wacom tablet right now. And just remember that for this, um, I have a, th a three button uh, Wacom stylus pen here. And if you want to navigate in Mudbox, you really want to use a pen here. And you can use these pens, if it'll let me, oops. Um, so I go to Intuos, which is the name of the tablet I'm using, pen settings, and here we go. And I have it set so normal click is right there, right click is right there, middle click is right there. Normally that's gonna be set on double click by default, so just move it up to middle click and it'll make it so that you can navigate your camera around without any going to any weird buttons or menus and stuff like that. It'll just navigate as you go here. So remember the the error message, the high valence vertices or whatever it was, that, that those red dots are showing me that there's a lot of um, edges coming to that point. That might care that might matter if we were sculpting, but we're painting, so it doesn't matter. So it's uh, mesh and then or sorry, display. And then mesh errors right there. So I'm just going to turn those off. And remember, so I've shown a little bit of the sculpting here in Mudbox using these tools. And we have the paint tools right here. So if we want to paint on this, we'll use these tools. And a lot of these tools are kind of what you would imagine if you're familiar with um, Photoshop or any digital painting software. The paintbrush is kind of the main one. Airbrush is really helpful. Um, eyedropper, really helpful because you can kind of pick a color and then continue to paint with it and we'll go over this in detail. Um, so these are our tools right here. Over here we have a bunch of tabs and the only one you really need to mess with for today's lesson is just that these are the preview material so this isn't even the real material this is just what the material will preview as while we're working in Mudbox and so I just turn it to chalk white here or a gray and that just makes it so when we're painting colors we're getting an accurate depiction of what we're painting here. And before I had pressed W, that's how I got this wireframe on it. And let's see here. If you look over here on the right, this is kind of our layers menu and things like that. So right now we're under the layers tab and we have the sculpt tab. We're not sculpting right now, so we don't need to worry about that. We're gonna paint, so we're gonna use the paint tab. Um, just to kind of give you a, a rest of the overview of this area right here, we have the object list. And this is like the outliner in Maya where it shows us all the objects or things that are in the scene. So we have our cameras right here, the perspective view, and then we have our orthographic views right there. We have just the default light, the default materials. And then right here is our object. And it turns yellow when you select it. If you press the plus button right here, it shows you subdivision levels. And so the subdivision levels are important when you are sculpting, but it does not matter at all when you're doing painting. So um, we can ignore that. So just to make sure that our model isn't yellow, I'll just click on the, the default material and kind of get it unselected there. And so now we can start worrying about painting. And just before I paint, we have these tools right here. Sorry, my computer's lagging a little bit. So I have, I clicked on the main paintbrush, which is the tool I'll probably use most of the time during this lesson here. And you can see here when I clicked on paintbrush, and you might need to double click to see this, we get the, the color of the paint, we get the size of the brush, the strength of the brush. You can set it to mirror across the X axis right there. You can change which axis is gonna mirror across. Right here is in the world, um, meaning within the world of the scene here. You can also switch it to local so that it'll always kind of bisect the model if your model's not completely centered. So um, world X is fine for this model. And let's see here. Oops. So, sorry, my computer is really slowing down here. So the you can get these controls by just clicking on it over here. But what I prefer to do is I like to hold down spacebar and here under spacebar you get all the controls you really need while you're painting in one menu and you don't have to go looking around and so it kind of just makes the workflow a little more fun while you're operating this and a little more intuitive because you can find everything you need here so right here this is the strength of the brush so if i click on it it's probably a little hard to see but you can see this line going all the way up 
So that means it's at 100%. Watch the slider on the right where it says strength. Do you see down, sorry, I'm gonna let go. Watch this slider right here under strength. That's the slider we're messing with here. So if I take it up, it's all the way up, take it all the way down, and then it'll go down to a small strength right there. I want the strength to be at 100 here. And in that case, you might wanna just drag this thing up here. But um, brush size is this one right here. So you just click in it, drag up, drag down, and you get these different brush sizes right there. And additionally, you have all these other controls which become more and more useful as you get deeper and deeper into Mudbox here. So for instance, if I click on here, I get all of the tools that are in the bottom left of my screen right now. You can see that I have the paintbrush there. I have um, the projection brush, the eyedropper brush is right there. So all these tools that are right there show up in this little box right here. And you can just explore all these different boxes here. So you can kind of get to most of the things that you're ever gonna need right there. So just uh, kind of keep that in mind. So I might click on this again and then go to paintbrush, which is the bottom. And I want this to be purple. So I have the strength at 100%. That's really important because I want to make sure that this base coat is totally filled with color here. I'm using a huge brush. Oh, and you can see here, I tried to paint and it gives me this message. So let me cancel out of that real quick. And I'm gonna to go to the layers tab. And we need to paint on a layer, right? In Photoshop, if you're painting, you, you need some kind of layer to be painting on or else nothing's gonna happen, right? So you can either create a new layer by pressing this button right here where my cursor is, where you see these three pieces of paper stacked on top of each other in the top left. Or I could just click on the model and it gives me that that message I just got, where it says create a new paint layer. This is great. Um, I think by default, typically it'll be at set at 2048 right here. Um, that might be fine for you, but I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and go to 4096. I'll typically kind of work in that setting. The rest of this is, this is fine. This is the format. And right here is the channel. And so in 3D world, diffuse is also another word for color map. So if you ever are looking in the Hypershade in Maya or you're looking in another program and you see the word diffuse, that typically means like the main color, the, the color map right there. And you can see here, if we wanted to, we could paint in some other maps right here if we decided. So I'll press okay. And you can see that layer shows up here. Um, staying on that theme here, we have the opacity slider right here. And we can paint on new layers just by clicking new layers right there and changing their opacity so we can blend painting layers here. So, but let me just go ahead and start painting this. And I'm just gonna paint this all the way in. Remember my brush is at 100% opacity, so I'm just gonna go around and keep my mirroring on for a bit. And Paint that right on. I'm rotating again by using the option button and uh, clicking on the three buttons on my um, stylus here. So I painted in the whole base layer purple right here. And this, keep in mind the material that I'm using. I'm using the chalk material, so it kind of has like this non specular look to it. You know, you could also paint it in on something like the gesso material down here if you want something with a little more um, specularity to it. So I have the base coat there. Let's say that I wanna paint this using layers. So I can just click, make sure that diffuse is still selected right there. Click a new layer and press okay. You can see a new paint layer shows up and you can name these two. I can double click on it and I call this base. Double click on this and call this dots. And I can click here and change the color and paint in some, let's paint in some green dots. So I could use, I, I could use like some other brushes like the pencil tool, the airbrush, but I'm gonna keep using the, the paintbrush tool here. So I'll hold down space bar and take the brush size all the way down. I'm gonna paint at 100% opacity, particularly because I'm painting on a new layer. So I can, if this comes in too strong, I can always change it after the fact here. So you can paint these in. You can also, one thing that's nice here, it's since I'm on a new layer, I can just go over to erase and erase the layer right there. Um, and I can press edit undo to undo that and then click back on the paintbrush to start painting again. And 
So that's really that's one example of why working in layers is really advantageous here, because particularly as you start kind of painting in more complicated things and starting to use things like this projection tool, which we'll go over down the road, um, using that erase tool on a layer to layer basis is going to be really helpful here. Okay, so I think that's enough dots. And so if I what I'm talking about with the opacity slider, right, is if I click here, you can see it's set at 100. If I click here and drag that down, I can take the opacity of what I just painted up and down. And so I could continue to make layers or paint on top of these layers and paint this thing up. And I have symmetry on, so this is going to be totally symmetrical. Most of the time with fur, right, a character is not going to be totally symmetrical there. So kind of keep that in mind that you might not always want to have symmetry on while doing this. And yeah, typically I would add more layers to this and add more detail, maybe start using the airbrush to get some subtle gradations, right? I'll go back to my base layer. I can use the eyedropper tool to get that purple again and use my airbrush, click on this and make it like a little bit of a darker version and do some things where you can get just like a little bit of subtle variation. Since I'm working on an existing layer, I might need to take my strength down to like 29. Oops. All right. Well, my computer's starting to slow down a lot. So let me just kind of not obsess about all that stuff. But I just wanted to show that you can kind of go into some more detail on this thing here. So let's see if my computer will catch back up. So yeah, keep in mind that when I'm doing these zoom captures, the, you know, these computers really slow down a lot here. So to export this, so we want to export the color map. Exporting the color map is pretty simple in Mudbox. I just uh, don't right click on either this layer or that layer. Right click where it says diffuse up here. And if you right click on it, you'll get this menu. And we can export um, this whole channel to a PSD or we can export channel merged. I'm okay exporting it merged here. Either of these options kind of works. So I'll just do export channel merged here. And it's automatically going to go into the source images of your project folder, or it should, which is great. Um, and so I'll call this, if I can get my cursor to catch back up again, I'll call this trash to color. PNG is fine. You can change the format here to whatever you want it to be, but a PNG will work. And I'll press save. And, oh wait, what does it tell me there? Let's see, oh. So PNG will be fine. You can see it is saving down there in the bottom left. And so now we have a color map. And let me close that out. And so here, and keep in mind that we have the root color and the base color. So we could hypothetically go into Photoshop and make a light version and a dark version and kind of change with the colors there and pr provide two different maps off of that one map that we did. So that's a good example of when Photoshop could be really useful here. Um, so this is my project folder right here. And under source images, that color map that I just exported is right here, trash to color PNG. And you can see that's what I painted in right there. And kind of what I was blabbering about before is we have the the root color and the tip color. So I could take this PNG and I could open in Photoshop and then have this be like my root color. And then for my tip color, I could just paint in or use the, the controls to make something a little bit lighter here. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and show it because I think that could be helpful to see. So open with Photoshop 2021. And I'll let that open for a second. And while that's opening, I'll go ahead and start this process. So that map I just made, I'm going to use as my root color. And then in Photoshop, I'm going to adjust it and then make that my tip color here. And so with the fur groom selected, we're kind of back in Maya now, right? And <laughs> right, right when I say that, it goes to Photoshop. Um, we'll see here. Okay. And I'm going to close out Mudbox because my computer is really lagging. And I'm just normally save save your scene in Mudbox, but since this is a demo, I'm not going to save it here. Um, 
And um, OK, so we have this. And I want to take my color maps and apply it. So right now we have pink, and I want purple with green polka dots. So the root color is what I just painted there. So all I need to do, right, is this is filling in the whole fur one color. So I just click on the checkerboard box to start applying my my color map that I just painted. So you press that checkerboard box. This window comes up. I click on File, fourth down, and then the attribute editor changes on the right. And Let's see, I just need to scroll down a little bit and go down to where it says image name and there's a folder to the right of it. Click on the folder and then find the PNG or the image file that you made in Mudbox and it will update under there. And so it's not apparent yet because I need to change the tip color too. But just to kind of illustrate that you can kind of use Photoshop to your advantage here. So I have this in Photoshop and let's just, I could paint over this or I could use image adjustments and do like brightness and contrast, for instance, and I could add some brightness to make like a brighter version of this. I could also make um, an adjustment layer. You can make adjustment layers by clicking on this little almost Ghostbusters thing right down here. And I can mess with hue and saturation. That could be a good one. So adjustment layer makes a layer on top in Photoshop where you make some con changes to the hue saturation, things like that, using the hue saturation adjustment layer. And it applies those changes to anything underneath, underneath it in the layer view here. So for instance, if I wanted to change, you know, the, the hue a little bit, maybe change the saturation up, the lightness up a little bit and just have a slight variation of this thing for that that tip area. So let's just make this adjustment. It'll be relatively subtle, but I think it'll be good. And then I'll just go to File, Save a Copy, rather than File Save As. Save As is a way to save a PSD or a TIFF, which honestly would be fine, but I'm gonna save a copy because I just want this to be a simple JPEG or PNG. And so, PNG right there, and I'll call this, instead of copy, I'll call this tip, and just press through. Okay, so now I have a slight variation of this thing that is, I have the root that I'm painted in Mudbox, and I have the tip, which I kind of made an adjustment to it in Photoshop. So I click on Fur Groom. You can see root color shows up as black, and there's a play button next to it, because I already plugged in my color map there. For tip color, I'm going to do the same thing. Click on the checkerboard, fourth down, click on file. Go down here under the attribute editor where it says folder, and then click on that. And then find that new PNG that I made and press open. And things are looking a little funky in my preview. So let's see, hopefully this thing worked. Let me, I have my lights on, so let's do an Arnold render and see if this worked. There we go. I don't understand why my preview is showing up brown, but you can see when I render it that I have my polka dots painted into my hair right here. So that's um, a major helpful control right there. So you remember at the beginning of this lesson, I said that I was going to do kind of two lessons in one. And so that's kind of the end of the first lesson, which is like very comprehensive, the big picture, kind of how to use interactive groom editor. And then lesson two is going to be um, shorter. So don't worry. And it's just kind of to show you a few uh, things that you might want to do with your character to set it up to kind of start this process that I'm showing right here. So I am just going to save this. And I'm going to open up my character scene here, <laughs> which is going to be a little hard to find. So I have my character here. And I'm going to switch over to my UV editing view to show you this process right here. And so what I'm going to show is really simple and straightforward. I just want to show you that, um, actually, sorry, my classic view. Um, I, I want to show you kind of some of the basic things that you might want to do before setting this thing up. So this thing is UV'd, and 
I might want to smooth this character before proceeding here. That That's a decent amount of geometry, but it could be good for me just to smooth right there and get it to this subdivision level. That looks a little better to me. And I have things on display layers down here. So I have my main layer. So my main layer is where the fur is going to grow out of. And so remember in the demo, we, we created a sphere and then I projected or created hair coming out of every surface coming out of it. With a character, right, that's not what's going to happen. We don't want hair coming out of their eye sockets in their mouth here. And so the way that um, this is an area where having good topology is really helpful here. But if you have bad topology, you can get around it. But it's you know just going to be a little bit funkier. Um, and basically, you just want to select the faces where you want the fur to come out of. And so um, if I right click and select face, Right, this is part, there's many reasons why I did this, but this one of the reasons why I set edge loops going around the mouth. You see all those faces perfectly circle the mouth instead of stair-stepping around, or sorry, I'm saying mouth, I mean eye, um, instead of stair-stepping around it right there. Um, same for the mouth here. So if I click on a face there and then shift double, oh, shift and double click, it goes around the mouth right there. So you can tell it's gonna be really easy to kind of get those loops going. So I want the fur to go everywhere on this character except for around the eyes and around the mouth. And so the way I can set that up is first, I might just like to have some history in my model. I'm just gonna, you can see here, that's where you can see that your history hasn't been deleted right there. And it's, it's a good practice just to go through and delete your history every now and then. So edit, delete by type, history. The reason being, errors can start to come up and get weird with my if you don't, if you go too long without doing it there. So sorry for the digression here. Um, so to select the faces for which the hair is going to come out of here, I like to go to the UV editing view or workspace and switch over to the two view, switch this view. It should just show up on your um, layer editor or sorry, your UV editor, but mine didn't do that. So I went to Panels, Panel, then down to the bottom to UV Editor. And let's try that again. Let's see, Panels, Panel, UV Editor. There we go. So we get our UV Editor view, view there. And then I have the front view here, but I'd rather have the perspective. So I'm going to go Panels, Perspective, Perspective. And we have our model here. And you can see that I've UV'd it because the paper is kind of spread out over that zero to one to zero to one grid and things look checkerboarded over here. So things are laid out okay. And so something I can do to really quickly select the phases I want this um, to have hair come out of them is I can just right click over here and go to UV shell. If you remember UVing, the UV shell is a way to select a whole shell at the same time. And so I can click the front, click the back, and I need to click this area where the, the horns are right there. And I'm good to go, basically, at that point. Um, there's a chance, let's say, for instance, that you would rather the hairline start one face further away. You know, maybe that hair starting too close in towards the eye for your taste. You can, when you, you, when you right click and you go to UV shell, in a sense, you're kind of selecting faces here. So if I right click, go to face mode and then I can just press control and click and then hold down shift and control and double click oops sorry control and double click that I should oh, have a little bit of trouble let's see here Usually get that to work. Let's see here. Control, double click. Nope. Control. Well, shoot. Let's see here. So, oh, one thing here too is make sure symmetry is on. And I'm going to do object X. So, hopefully, if I deselect a face over here, 
it deselects the face on the other side, right? So that'll kind of make your selections a little bit easier. Okay, I did the same thing again, but this time it worked. I selected a face and pressed control to deselect it. Then I went to the next face and pressed control and it deselected the whole edge loop or face loop. So let me try that again. So again, I'm holding down control, click one, double click the next, and it deselects there. So right now the fur would start wherever the, um, the face has become selected right there. So maybe that's a good one to choose. And I might, this is kind of going too far into the mouth. So right now, so I can just hold down control, click one, control, hold, still holding down control, double click, holding control still this whole time, click one, double click, control one, double click. And now the fur kind of starts in that spot on the lip. And I find it to be much, much easier to get the selection correct before you start the fur process rather than um, trying to like groom the hair once you've extruded out of every orifice on the body here. So let's say that this is what I want here. Um, I would probably, I'm not gonna waste your time with this, but on my model I have some horns coming out of here and I might deselect the fur in here as well, just for my character. So keep that in mind, I'm not gonna waste our time on that. Um, so I know you all are busy here. So um, now this, this is a good time to generate the fur here if you're working on your character model, right? So I'm gonna go into the workspace to, um, where is it, XGen Interactive Groom. And we'll switch over, it might take some thinking here. And we're back to that view that we've been on most of the lesson here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn symmetry off. And if I go to create, and then interactive groom splines, right? We're kind of back to where we started at the beginning of this lesson where I was showing how to use the interactive groom editor. So I'll just kind of go with the default here and my computer's really slowing down. So fingers crossed that it doesn't crash here because I have um, zoom capture or screen capture going here. So I'm gonna press apply. Okay, and close there. And so one reason that this fur appears shorter and my computer's really slowing down right now, but um, one reason that the fur appears a little shorter right now than it did in the demo is just simply that my character model is a lot larger than that, that sphere that we imported in. Do you see that the perspective grid down there, my, my character right now dwarfs it and in the demo it was much smaller down there. And honestly, I suggest when you're modeling your characters to kind of work in a size like this. But you can see here that I now start from a place where the fur is kind of coming out of all the right directions. I'll probably need to do some grooming around the eyes, right? Since the faces are kind of poking out in that direction, I need to kind of either comb that hair away from the eye or um, cut it. But I don't have hair going in the sockets, which is great. I don't have hair going in the mouth, so I have like a really nice starting point here. And if I want the hair to be longer, right, you can click on scale under the attribute editor with fur groom selected right there. And I can just increase the scale there. And now I have longer and longer hair. And we just go through the same process that I was showing before with the demo model, right? We, by default, all the hair is totally uniform and it's kind of square. So we need to taper it, we need to color it. There's kind of a lot of steps to do there, but the whole grooming system is really intuitive when you get down to it. Um, and so, as a final note, just before we cut this, this demonstration off, is um, this step that I showed here at the end is really important when dealing with your characters. It's going to save you a lot of headache and time to make sure that you have the right faces selected before you start generating the fur. And um, additionally, it's super important when doing the fur. It's very artist friendly and it's pretty straightforward here, but the um, it's not going to work unless you have a project folder that's set up with like this, right? Where you, um, at the beginning of the, the process, you set up your project folder, set up the project window, have all these properly organized. I have all of my image files saved in source images here. I have all my scenes saved in scene and kind of keeping it organized here. And um, as long as you have that going, and you back things up, obviously, then you're, I think you should be in good shape as you do this, this project here.